what, what I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is essentially my day job, which is running an organization that was created uh, almost 27 years ago uh, to advise the Office of Science Technology Policy in the White House, and then by extension, other uh, parts of the executive branch on formulating the national uh, S&T portfolio. So the organization that I run, uh, Science Technology Policy Institute, STIPI as we call it, which sounds like a disease, doesn't it? But, but that's the name we were given. Um, it's got an interesting history. Uh, we are a federally funded research development center. I know a lot of people in this room know what that is, but I'll, I'll expand, expand on that a bit. Um, created by act of Congress. As far as I can tell, we're the only FFRDC that was actually created by act of Congress. In fact, when we were created, it was against the wishes of the organization that we were supposed to be supporting. So not necessarily a recipe for success. Though I think 20, 27 years later, we've, we've, we've got the formula uh, uh, down pat. Um, and the goal was to create an organization that could provide uh, uh, scientific, technical uh, uh, analysis to the White House. Um, it was honestly created because at the time there were some members of Congress who were extraordinarily concerned about the United States losing its lead in a few key technologies. And the country that they were most worried about, and, and I love to ask our young folks when they come on board, I said, what country were they worried about? And they would say, oh, it had to be Russia. No. It had to be China. No. It was Japan. It was the late 80s, early 90s. Everyone was worried about Japan. And you know what a difference a few decades make. I, I haven't heard anyone express concern about Japan in, 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 in quite some time. But, and so the idea was that, that there were members of Congress who thought that the White House was frankly dropping the ball and wasn't paying attention to trends in science and technology around the world. And so they created us as an FFRDC. And for those of you who aren't familiar, FFRDCs are actually an amazing construct within the federal government system. Uh, there are 43 of these. Uh, we are one of the very smallest. The largest ones are the national labs. And essentially, FFRDCs are created as to provide independent, objective analysis to some part of the federal government. Uh, among my favorite examples of FFRDCs, the, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory is an FFRDC. It is operated by Caltech for NASA. So if you meet a JPL employee, uh, they sometimes describe themselves as NASA employees. But really, they're mostly Caltech employees who support NASA. Um, in the same vein, we are operated by the Institute for Defense Analyses on behalf of the White House and funded, interestingly enough, through the National Science Foundation for that mission. And if we're doing that job right, we do a couple of things. One, we meet a long-term research and development need for the sponsoring agency. Um, as I like to say, uh, we're, we're kind of the corporate memory for a part of the government which has a particularly high turnover rate with detailees coming in and coming out. Um, we can do deep dives. We do independent, objective analysis. Um, one of the things I like to say is if we do our job right, we, we get to tell the truth. Which, and, and I'm a block across the street from the White House, so there aren't a lot of people in that AOR who can actually make that claim that we get to tell the truth. But actually, we get, we get away with it uh, uh, more often than not. Um, we're the only FFRDC that, as it is written into US code, and, and I want to highlight that because it, it kind of reflects on the mission and, and some of the things that I'll be talking about today. So when we were created, we were, we were created to do a couple of things. One, uh, look at significant developments and trends in science and technology. Um, across the board, looking at the scope and content of federal science technology writ large, right? um, analyzing the long-term strength of, uh, and, and development of science technology in the United States. And then we've got some other responsibilities. We've got this wonderful catch-all, which is to carry out any function that the director of the Office of Science Technology Policy, who is usually the president's science advisor, anything that he wants us to do, we get to do. So that's written in the code. Now, of course, right now there is no director of OSTP. So we're in a little bit of a hiatus. But normally, we would be at the beck and call of the, the head of OSTP for the, those sorts of studies. Now, I'll give you a little bit of inside dirt. When STIPI was first created, IDA was not operating. It was operated by the RAND Corporation. And after 10 years, the White House requested a recompete. They weren't satisfied with what RAND was doing. Now, I've got a lot of friends who were at the White House at the time and who were at RAND. And essentially, they tell a very consistent story of what, why that wasn't working. And the reason was that RAND was actually doing exactly what was written in the legislation. And it turned out not to be all that useful for OSTP. Right? There was this tendency to bring big reports and drop them on the desk, say, OK, we've now studied the health of technology across the globe. And then you know, drop it on the desk of the president's science advisor and say, uh, OK, what do I do with this? 
So, you know, I think when IDA stepped in, and, and, and this was long before my time, but they took a much more operational view of how the organization should run. And so we, we do this, but we also do a lot of day-to-day -day analysis. Sometimes it's a, it's a one-day uh, turnaround telephone call. You know, a question comes in from the Oval Office, for example. Um, can a solar flare really wipe out the entire electric power grid as we know? Yeah, it can do that. Uh, can an asteroid wipe out all life on the planet? Yeah, yeah well, the answer seems to be yes, but we'll get back to you on that. So, so we, we, do, we do a fair amount of tactical as well as strategic work. But at the end of the day, I kind of distill our, our task down as follows, which is we, we address a, a few key questions. First, what should the nation be doing in science and technology? Second, um, are, are, we in, are we investing wisely? Are we spending our precious taxpayer dollars the best way? And, and third, are, are we properly positioned for the future? And in some ways, that's, that's the most difficult question that we get asked, and we get asked that question often. You know, as I like to say, it, it's, it's very easy to make predictions about the future. The, the challenge is to be correct. And, and I think everyone in this room is engaged in, in, in that sort of exercise to a certain, certain extent. Right? Um, why do we do this? Well, there's, there's a, a lot of pressure to make sure that uh, federal requirements, uh, federal activities are monitored and assessed, that metrics are applied, that we know if we're spending wisely. Uh, Congress has, has uh, uh, introduced significant legislative uh, uh, statements that uh, affect. A number of organizations have looked at this Office of Management and Budget, even as, as recently as 2015, issued guidance uh, specific to the evaluation of, of R&D efforts. So this is a theme across the government. Um, other motivating policies. So uh, in 2018, the Office of Management and Budget did, uh, released delivering government solutions in the 21st century. Um, suggesting that evaluation capabilities are, are an important attribute for the agencies that are funding s and uh, General Accounting Office, um, also uh, looking at agency-wide evaluation sort of activities, program evaluations. I was just at the General Accounting Office yesterday, and they're looking at stepping up their activities in reviewing s and efforts uh, across the government. You may recall there was an organization that supported Congress many years ago called OTA, the Office of Technology Assessment. It was ultimately disbanded. Uh, one way I describe what we do at STIPI is it's kind of an executive, executive branch version of OTA. Um, many people have observed that the gap left by the, by the disbanding of OTA has never quite been filled. And there's even discussion today about recreating an OTA-like entity that might be, might be centered in uh, General Accounting Office or possibly aligned with uh, Congressional Research Service. So uh, definitely on, on the table. Um, for the rest of the talk, I want to zero in on a couple of the things that we've done at our organization that I think might be relevant to the sorts of activities that uh, that ONR and AFOSR and, and, and uh, similar organizations pursue. And, and that is assessing and evaluating and deciding exactly what to invest in. What are the things that, 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 that are important for a, a, a fundamental science organization to be focused upon? And, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of studies that we've done, projects that we've done, that I think are, are relevant to, to, uh, to, to uh, everyone in this room. And, and I want to start out with a basic question of how do you manage a portfolio? How do, you, how do you decide what it is that you're going to invest in? And I know, again, this is a challenge that everyone, everyone in this room wrestles with. Right? Any program manager at, a, at an organization like ONR or AFOSR is thinking about, how do I decide where I put my precious dollars? So a little bit of, a little bit of background. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, AFOSR came to us and, and asked us to look at the big question of how they map out the future investments for, for the organization. And, and I saw Ken Goretta in, the, in the, the room earlier. Ken was, was the principal lead on this, uh, on this activity. Um, and and it, it took several forms. There were several questions involved. The first was, um, are there automated tools that can be used to correctly predict trends in s and And a lot of folks have developed these tools. At the time, one of the most common tools was something called Fuse that was developed by IARPA the Intelligence Advanced Research uh, Projects uh, activity. And so among our goals was to evaluate whether AFOSR's research portfolio, first, did it address the long-term technical capabilities that, that the Air Force was looking for? And then to see if we could use some of these tools to identify emerging areas of research. And then you, taking those, um, help the agency address strategic planning. I think very candidly, um, the uh, Air Force goes, goes review process for the Air Force Research Lab 
AFOSR was coming up for its review by the Scientific Advisory Board, and uh, the board was asking questions. How do you formulate your portfolio? So we're doing this in part to help them prepare for their meeting with the Scientific Advisory Board. OK, so we began by considering how do you formulate a future portfolio? What are the steps that you do? And, and really, you can, you can kind of bookkeep in, in, in three basic areas. First is the expert-based approach. That's when you get a bunch of really smart people, uh, subject matter experts. Uh, you do interviews. You do workshops. You ask them, what, where, what are the investment trends? What are the emerging areas? What are the things that we haven't thought about? Um, Expert-based approaches have gotten a bad rap recently. Uh, in the last few years, there have been a lot of people questioning the value of expert-based approaches. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert and show you that, in fact, it's still a pretty good way to figure out where to do your investments. So, so the smart people that you draw upon for formulating your investments um, are, are still bring tremendous value to the process. The other is just to do the age-old literature review. All right? Look at what's been done. Look at what's being done. Look at trends. What papers are being presented at conferences? What papers are showing up in the journals? And then the third is to try to use an algorithmic approach, and that is some sort of tool, some sort of, I hate the term artificial intelligence, but if you will, an artificial intelligent tool that looks at the range of projects, tries to predict what are the emerging growing areas that essentially calculates derivatives of citations, mathematical derivatives, not, not economic derivatives, and from that extrapolates to, to where future investments should be made. So for AFOSR, we, we did all those. We focused on two approaches. Uh, one was to do a, 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 an overview of international research priorities, uh, as stated by other countries. And the other was this program that I mentioned that IARPA developed called FUSE, which is one of those algorithmic predictive approaches that, that, that fuses all this uh, data from journals and conferences and tries to put this together into some map that gives you a future, future direction. FUSE stands for Foresight and Understanding from Scientific Exposition. I'm sure it's an example where they came up with the acronym first and then figured out what the acronym stood for. But, and you know, it, again, it's predicting, it, it attempts to predict the future within a two to three year window. All right, so we did the following approach to using FUSE. Um, we took outputs from uh, uh, algorithms from one of the teams that IARPA had been funding. We did filters for terms from within the scientific literature. Uh, we were able to narrow down a very, very long list of terms to a much shorter list, but still a large list of terms. Uh, and then we brought in sets of subject matter experts to look at what FUSE pre uh, predicted and to compare it to what they would have selected in terms of emerging areas. And so we got some interesting results as soon as we did that. Uh, first, in one area, so we looked at the general broad area of physics for emerging areas, and FUSE gave us about 5,000 terms and then filtered it down to 141 separate terms. So a lot of those 5,000 terms had some duplication and some overlap. So get it down to 141 terms, and then we handed it to subject matter experts and said, what do you think? And the subject matter experts were basically able to sort those into 42 different areas of research. And when all was said and done, they said, you know, of those 42 different areas that FUSE produced, really only 10 of them were emerging areas. The rest were, eh, probably current, probably important, but not really fit the de definition of, 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 uh, of emerging. And by the way, the subject matter experts also pointed out to us that emerging areas don't necessarily have to be new areas. It could be an old area that's being revived, which is an important point that we discovered algorithmic approaches don't always appreciate. The same thing with material science got essentially the exact same result. You get uh, uh, your algorithm produces this uh, this entire, this long list of terms, you filter them down, the subject matter experts look at them. When they're all done, they look at that list and they said, you know, really only nine, in this case, in material science, only nine of those 55 areas that they came up with were what you would consider to be emerging. Overall, uh, subject matter experts told us that a third of the, uh, the, the materials uh, research areas that FUSE predicted uh, were noteworthy. So the algorithmic approaches only work so far. And we also did an analytic approach. All right, so we did top down, bottom up. Uh, top down means that we identified um, using, in this case, it was for AFOSR, so we used the Air Force's capability uh, requirements. Uh, we looked at future capabilities. Uh, from those capabilities, we figured out which technology areas would inform those capabilities. We did a drill down, and that was kind of the target portfolio. And then we did the bottom up, which is 
uh, you ask AFOSR, uh, what are you doing? What are you funding? Uh, what are your current investment priorities? And looked at how those map into, the, into, into those target portfolios. Identify gaps. And, and the good news was that we actually found very few gaps between those two. So, so the main report card that we provided to AFOSR was, you know, you're doing a pretty good job. You're, you're, you've formulated a portfolio that's, that's doing a, a, very fine, uh, a, it's a very fine effort in terms of meeting future Air Force needs. Um, we also looked at uh, lists of uh, research areas in the American Physical Society. Uh, we found a number of research areas that those algorithmic approaches, those artificial intelligence approaches, just frankly didn't pick up on. Uh, seven popped up in physics that FUSE completely missed altogether. And, and our overall findings on this, and the report that we gave, in addition to providing a list of areas that AFOSR should be invest, investing in, we also pointed out that, look, every approach that you use to formulate your portfolio has its pros and cons. So the good news is you will never replace human beings with algorithms. And subject matter experts are going to continue to be important in formulating your portfolio. We also, along the way, provided some other, some other warnings. Um, one of the things that we pointed out is that these algorithms have very strong biases based on the particular uh, journals that they look at, based on the conferences that they look at. Now, subject matter experts have biases too. Um, in most of the cases that we examined, their biases were different. So if you combine those two, you kind of get a more complete picture. But if you just went with one of them, you really didn't get a complete answer. So what we concluded, and this is kind of one of those, uh, after the fact, obvious results, which is no single approach should be used when you're formulating your portfolio. You want to do a combination of approaches to uh, identify your emerging research. Um, as a footnote, we recently went through an exercise very similar to this at STIPI for OSTP. And we followed our own advice. So we did some algorithmic approaches. We did some text mining. But at the end of the day, we convened, convened two subject matter expert panels uh, for two days. And we sat them down and said, OK, what do you guys think? What are the most important areas? And, and uh, it was a fun exercise because we got some results that we really hadn't intended, we hadn't expected, in that our, our predictive uh, 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 algorithmic approaches uh, would never have told us. All right, so let me, let me skip to another area that we've worked in, and that is advising on assessment. So how does a federal agency do its own assessment? And this came about because, uh, in this particular case, uh, ARPA-E, asked us to help them think through how they would create an internal assessment cell. And first thing we told them is, all right, there are very good reasons for doing this, why a federal agency wants to do its own assessment. All right? First is to make sure that you're, you're, uh, you're compliant with guidelines, responding to mandates coming from organizations, such as the Office of Management and Budget. The second is for external facing. All right? uh, you want to determine the impact of your programs, which in some ways is, is particularly difficult for an organization such as ARPA-E because it's not always obvious what their customer base is. Right? An organization like ONR, you, you know what your customer base is. AFOSR, you know who your customers are. ARPA-E, it's not always so clear. So having that external facing uh, capability can help determine the impact of their activities. And then also for their in internal analysis, um, assessing their portfolio. ARPA-E has a, has a funding portfolio that I think is smaller than either ONR or AFOSR. And, and so making sure they're using their money wisely, as, as for any agency, was especially critical. Um, so ARPA-E asks us, how should they do this? What should they do to, to do an internal, internal process? And so we decided to essentially give them a book report on how they could do internal assessment. And to do that, we essentially reviewed all the approaches across the federal agencies to build a database of essentially every organization that does S&T planning. How do they do, or do they do, any sort of self-assessment? And by the way, ARPA-E was doing this uh, not out of the goodness of, the heart, of their heart, but there had been a National Academy study that specifically told them they needed to do some internal assessment. So they were taking the advice to heart and trying to set up this effort. And you know, without, without, without um, Without giving away too many, too many uh, uh, backroom stories, as you can imagine, there was a lot of internal discussion about how assessment should be managed within the organization. Um, if you're in the front office, you're a fan of assessment. If you're a program manager, you might not be such a big fan of assessment. So we gave them these following research questions. First, you know, office mission, uh, function, staffing. How do you actually do this? What are the goals? What are, the, what, are, what are you hoping to get out of your assessment? What sort of data do you want to collect? Uh, what are the best practices and challenges? 
And, and so we, we did a review for all the federal agencies. We did some stakeholder interviews for them. We talked to people. We talked to ONR. Uh, we talked to another a pretty long list. In fact, I'll show you the list of agencies we talked to. Uh, that's pretty much, I think, almost everyone who does S&T funding, we talked to them, uh, including some of the, the non-standard ones. Uh, USAID, we talked to them about how they do their internal assessment. Um, they, act, they have a very active office that does evaluation and assessment. Uh, we talked to NIST, part of the Department of Commerce, uh, Health and Human Services. So they have uh, an assistant secretary for planning and evaluation that does uh, significant assessment activities uh, with, within their organization, even Department of Labor. And what we basically showed them was that when all is said and done, you can, you, you can sort assessment functions into one of four different models, uh, either a limited role, an organization, a part of the organization that does training and guidance, uh, something that, that actually does platform development and produces data analytics, or something that, honest to goodness, manages and performs evaluations for each portion of the portfolio. And the way these various organizations use those different office functions varied, not surprisingly, by the mission of those organizations. We kind of sorted the various funding agencies into this list. Uh, DARPA, not surprisingly, had the most limited assessment. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have metrics. They have metrics within their programs. But at a top level headquarters, uh, headquarters function, uh, very, very limited program assessment. Uh, probably uh, that's fundamental to the way DARPA operates, the fact that they don't do that sort of uh, a deep dive assessment, because that means that DARPA program managers are allowed to fail. Um, then ranging down to the most, uh, uh, most managed portfolio, assessment portfolio, we called our Model D which uh, is most represented by organizations like NIST, Health and Human Services, and USAID. Um, ONR uh, fell into our Model C, where there's platform development, data analytics, but not as strong a headquarters assessment function as we, as we, as we assessed it. And we also pointed out to RPE that there are additional aspects or evaluation capabilities. Um, internal staff and external contractors uh, are included in their performers. Uh, you do data collection analysis and then dissemination of that information. So let me switch gears again to another function that we've done with assessment. And that is reviewing laboratory operations, reviewing a laboratory portfolio. And this is something that we did for the Department of Energy in response to a congressional mandate that DOE do a full up review of all of their laboratories. So in 2014, Congress passed this. Uh, uh, Congress uh, passed uh, w within the DOE funding bill a requirement that a commission to review the effectiveness of the national energy laboratories be set up. Um, the background story is there were a number of staffers at the time on the Hill who were convinced that the Department of Energy laboratories had significant overlap and redundancy. You know, there are 17 DOE laboratories, and surely all 17 labs can't be doing unique and, and separate functions. And so it was really a arguably a preliminary step to try to do something like a DOE BRAC. And so this commission was set up. And as you can imagine, it created a, um, a lot of consternation within the Department of Energy. Right? When this commission showed up at a given uh, lab, um, it was the, the classic example of the, the two biggest lies in, in Washington. Hi, we're from headquarters, and we're here to help. And the response is, and we're glad you're here. So, so those were both lies on both sides whenever this commission showed up. At any rate, so this commission operated until about 2015. And they were charged with doing an assessment of the labs, looking at alien, uh, uh, the alignment, um, making sure there was no redundancy or duplication. As an interesting aside, you may know the Department of Energy Laboratories, some of them were actually specifically set up to provide duplication and to have some competition and redundancy. But that, that, that subtlety was lost. Um, also asking if, and this was one of my favorite questions, whether the labs were correctly using their internal research and development funds to meet the DOE objectives. So in some ways, similar to the sorts of questions that an organization like FOSR or ONR would address. And then whether there are opportunities to more effectively use the capabilities of national labs, looking at ways to reorganize the laboratories. All right, so long list of framing questions. I won't go through all these questions, but you see they, they basically uh, get at the fundamental uh, uh, charge of uh, the commission, including that question number two. Uh, people were convinced that the commission was a laboratory BRAC commission. It was not, but it was arguably the first steps that might one day lead to a laboratory BRAC commission based on their recommendations. Um, and then 
the commission reached out to us to essentially do the background research, uh, to do their planning, their scope, to do their uh, data collection, to kind of ghostwrite the report. The interesting, the, the perhaps the most intensive part of this work was I had a team that had to visit all 17 national laboratories. Now, why visit all 17? Well, if you visited one, you had to visit all. So we visited all 17 national laboratories. And uh, man, they racked up the frequent flyer miles on that one. And then at the end of the day, drafted, report, drafted reports for review by the commission, and then supported the dissemination and outreach of that, of that report. Um, this is the list of national laboratories that they visited. They had 17 labs. Most of them are operated by the National Nuclear Security Administration, NNSA. Many of these are FFRDCs. But then other parts of DOE operate uh, labs as well. You've got the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, coming from the Energy and Efficiency Renewable Energy Office. Uh, National Energy Technology Lab, coming out of the Fossil Energy Office. Idaho National Lab, from the Nuclear Energy Office. So coordinating all those was actually a pretty significant effort. The study team that I had basically organized topics along the, the following uh, questions. One, uh, did the laboratories have sufficient freedom to operate? Uh, are they aligned to DOE goals? Are they maintaining their impact? Um, is their management effective? Uh, are they being efficient operations? We looked at their overhead, for example. That's been a common complaint about the DOE labs, right? Are, is their overhead too, too, uh, too high? And, um, you know, I will tell you that among the questions that we addressed, so we looked at uh, alignment and quality. Uh, does the DOE ha have processes in place to ensure appropriate alignment of their focus, right? Do they have processes in place to ensure laboratory research and development of consistent high quality? And, you know, this is a report that I think any laboratory at the end of the day would be absolutely delighted to have. Because we concluded that the DOE laboratories were, were in really good shape. Um, we concluded that they're an important national asset. We showed that uh, sometimes trust was broken, but that was when the labs weren't allowed to operate the way they were originally chartered to lab. So, uh, chartered to operate. So, um, and the ultimate result of this report was frankly the exact opposite, I believe, of what the original staffers were intending. Right? The report basically, and, and there were several congressional hearings that came out of this report. Our folks helped do those briefings. Um, there was a one-year review that was a follow-on. And at the end of the day, the, the report basically showed that there was relatively little redundancy. There was little, relatively little uh, um, um, uh, repetition of work between the various laboratories. And also showed that labs were using their internal funds quite effectively. They were doing some really good science. So, so that's an example of you of a lab thinks it's going to have a bad outcome, and they actually had a really good in outcome. So assessment can be a good thing. All right, let me switch gears again, kind of do a little bit of a whipsaw, and talk to you about the last evaluation, the last evaluation I'm going to cover today, which was on something that might be near and dear to the hearts of a lot of folks in this room. Um, and that is a review of the SMART program, which is a, a fellowship program run by the Tar Department of Defense, operated out of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And as part of the SMART program, they fund uh, students at the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral level to pursue STEM disciplines. And one of the cornerstone features of, of SMART is that after those students complete their degrees, they're expected to work in a DOD laboratory. So they go to uh, Navy labs, Army labs, Air Force labs, other parts within the Department of Defense. The, the neat part about this evaluation was we had access to essentially every single one of the SMART participants and past SMART, smart participants as well. Um, and, and that gave us an incredibly, incredibly rich database. Um, we knew where people had studied, if they had completed their degrees, where they wound up working. We did significant interviews with the participants. Are they happy with where they landed? Were they happy with the program? Were they happy with the management of the program? Um, were they satisfied in their ultimate, uh, uh, ultimate careers in the DOD? Um, we also looked at uh, the goals of the SMART program, including populating the Department of Defense with these you know, high-performing science technology professionals to see if, if SMART was, was meeting those objectives. All right, so quick overview of SMART, just for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, it's a pretty significant program. It's, it's uh, funded at about the $60 million a year level. Um, 
It's, um, it, it has uh, funded, let's see, uh, up until from 2006 to 2016, uh, almost 2,000 individuals have been funded. Uh, there's a category called re recruitment scholars, which are fresh ins. Um, and then there's academy, a, a, a category called retention scholars, people already affiliated with the DOD who get a smart scholarship to keep them within, within the system. Um, the vast majority of smart scholars were recruitment scholars, uh, very small, about 13% are the retention, uh, retention scholars. Um, they wind up being pretty uniformly distributed between the services. All right, go Air Force, 33% of the smart scholars go Air Force. Uh, Army, 32%. Navy's lagging just a little bit at 31%. And then other 4% go to, to other DOD agencies. Um, and you see that the program is heavily weighted towards bachelor's and PhD graduates. About a quarter are, are master's graduates. Uh, most of them are engineers, uh, some computer science, a few math, a few physical sciences, and then other disciplines. All right, so. Eligibility, just to tell you a little bit about who is eligible for a small scholarship, you gotta be a citizen of the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, or the United Kingdom. Uh, vast majority, uh, not surprisingly, United States citizens. Uh, gotta be a, a, an accredited US college or university. Um, the students are expected to, to spend their summers at DOD facilities, uh, mostly the uh, DOD laboratories. Um, and as a requirement, again, a key feature of this is when they are all done, these students have a service commitment to the Department of Defense. Um, it's a pretty nice scholarship, by the way. They get full tuition, they get stipend, they get a book allowance. Uh, the summer internship is, is uh, paid at a sponsoring facility. And, and again, they're, they're, they're guaranteed a full-time position within the DOD. So, so uh, you'd think it's a pretty good deal. Um, it's also a relatively cost-effective uh, uh, program. All right, average cost. Uh, comes in at about $135,000 per person, uh, less for bachelors, uh, most expensive are PhD degrees, not surprising. Uh, awards uh, run for about three years, uh, on average for PhDs, two years for bachelors and masters. So what were we asked to do? Um, so we were asked to, to first uh, conduct a process evaluation, all right? Look at the past successes, dig through all the data that was available. Uh, do an outcome and impact evaluation of the program and then kind of develop an evaluation plan going forward. And that was a really fun aspect about this because the folks in the SMART program office said, all right, you can take the data you've got today, but tell us going into the future, what data would you like to collect? All right, what are the new things that we should be collecting so that we can do the best assessment possible on the success of this program? Now, I'll also give you a little bit of background that I haven't put on the slide. Um, the SMART program gotten a bad name. There are entire blogs online of smart scholars who are totally dissatisfied with the program, who claim that the DOD has mismanaged it, that the DOD wasn't responsive to their needs. Uh, there are these horror stories about smart scholars being forced to pay back their, their tuition if they faltered in the program. There was one apocryphal story about a smart scholar who died, and then his parents were sent a bill by the Department of Defense to pay back all the money. So, so the program had gotten this bad name, and you know sometimes the squeaky sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So these these folks who are blogging about the program were getting a fair amount of attention. So that's kind of the context, and they're complaining to members of Congress that was getting back to OSD. So that was that was the desire for 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 us to do this. All right. So in that process evaluation, first we did the following. Wait. So what are the program goals? What are, what are you trying to what are you trying to accomplish with this program? Um, and. Honestly, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you can get down to a nutshell. More STEM professionals, more high quality STEM professionals within the DOD system, all right? We looked at the SMART program processes, how it's evolved, how it's changed, and then we looked at all the stakeholders. And that includes everyone from the students in the program to the people in the laboratories, the services that were benefiting from these individuals. How, how do they view the program? And so we asked the following questions, all right? Um, for the recruitment scholars, we asked, you know, did the SMART program actually attract these people into the program if they, and, and would they not have come anyway? Right? Would, they have not would, they, would they have not considered careers in the DOD? Um, and did the recruitment program attract a more diverse set of STEM professionals? By the virtue of this, this funding, did we, did we make funding available to people who normally wouldn't have gone into STEM fields and wouldn't have applied their STEM skills to the Department of Defense, all right? For retention, as similar questions, to what extent did the program, did the SMART program, inform their desire to remain within the DOD? And um, to what extent did the scholars who leave DOD facilities 
still join organizations that in some way benefit the Department of Defense. Could have been academia working on, on research for the Department of Defense. Could have been industry working on, on research for the Department of Defense, development capabilities, right? Um, we looked at quality. Yeah, question? And the SCG, no, we did not. Or the, the, the one that university, uh, they have a co-op program. Which is yeah, no, we didn't. No, that was that, that would have been an interesting thing to do as a comparison group. But that was that was kind of out of the scope of what we were doing. So as it is, uh, we we had, and, and, and the amount of data that we got in this program uh, is, is frankly headache-inducing. <laughs> um, um, it was a tremendous, tremendous amount, about a, a amount of data. We did over 230 interviews, uh, mostly with smart scholars. Um, across the board, the ones who were satisfied, the ones who weren't satisfied. Um, we interviewed s and managers. We interviewed faculty members, the academic advisors, to ask them what they thought of the program. Um, we did a survey that we administered uh, to the scholars. And normally, if you do a survey, if you get about a 25 30% response, you're doing well. We, we got almost a 64% a response rate. So that was, that was, that was quite remarkable. Um, you got to be careful with that because that tends to be biased by the less satisfied individuals. But but we had a lot of lot of satisfied responses as well. So let let's let's let me show you some of the things that we learned in this evaluation. Some of the things that come out of an evaluation like this. All right, the first thing is we, we said you know overall when all is said and done, uh, the program's processes are functioning pretty well. Uh, the program has attracted more and more students who applied, and we were able to clearly identify individuals. Who would, not have, who would not normally have considered careers in the Department of Defense if they had not gotten the SMART scholarship. So uh, that's, a, that's a plus for the program. It's accomplishing one of its goals. Um, and we were able to show that over time, the SMART program attracted uh, more DOD facilities to participate in the program. Right. So word was getting out across the Department of Defense. More people wanted the SMART scholars as, as, as part of their workforce. So that was also good. And we also showed that as word was getting out, more and more academic institutions, students from academic institutions, were participating in the SMART program. So again, that's another good thing. You're getting a more diverse set of universities that are sending their students, that are encouraging their students to apply for this program. We also looked at satisfaction. So remember all those blog reports, all those people who were complaining about the program. When we sat down and did the scientific, statistically balanced surveys, we found that overall, a really high satisfaction rate among the students who were in the program. Uh, that was kind of revealing. Yeah, there, are, there were notable people. There were, no, there were loud voices who were dissatisfied with the program. Uh, but by and large, uh, the, 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 happy, the, the happy, glad folks uh, far, far outweighed the ones who were dissatisfied. 88% uh, 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 of the, the respondents said that the advantages of the program outweighed the disadvantages. 87% said that the program was a benefit to their career. 84% would recommend the program to others. Um, almost 80%, 79% said, yeah, the expectations were met. Um, lowest ranking was the program being managed. There, there were concerns about the, the complaints we got, and some of these were anecdotal. You know, they would reach out to the OSD and not get help, uh, not, not get the responses that they need just on the, on the bureaucratic issues related to their program. Um, other things that we found, so we pointed out, look, the SMART program is incredibly complex. Lots of different people involved, students at all different levels, bachelors, masters, PhD. Uh, DOD people involved at all different levels. You've got you know, folks at headquarters. Uh, uh, you've got folks in the labs, uh, lab leadership. You've got individual components within the labs. Um, we found that the experience, and this will not be a surprise, but the experience of the smart scholars vary tremendously depending on where they got placed. If they went to laboratory A, they had a great experience. If they went to laboratory B, not so much. And that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, but we were able to show this quite, quite with, with, with a, a pretty detailed statistical analysis. Um, and so at the end of the day, we, we, I think we were able to, one of the added values we brought to the program, we said, look, one of your challenges includes properly matching the students who are in the program with the right facility and making sure that, that both the student, or the outgoing student and the facility are happy with the individuals that we, we get. All right. So some of the research questions that we looked at, again, you know, we looked at recruitment, we looked at retention, we looked at quality, spillover benefits. Um, first thing, remember I, I, I told you we were, we were uh, uh, probing the question of whether the SMART program increased the diversity of students coming into the DOD. Uh, unfortunately, the answer was no. We were not getting more underrepresented minorities really into the program. Now, um, there was one category where the SMART program was doing very well, and that is SMART was more gender diverse 
than other, than, 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 than other uh, STEM populations. So we're doing a, SMART was doing a great job in recruiting women, not so much on underrepresented minorities. And the program's not getting better with time. In fact, the population was actually getting less diverse with time, which was somewhat of a startling realization. But here's probably the most troubling finding that we found. Um, the recruitment scholars are actually less likely to stay in a DOD facility than other STEM employees. So that means we're spending all this money to train these people, to bring them into the DOD facilities, and we were forcing them to come in because as part of the deal that they were making, we paid for them, then they had to come work for us. And as part of that deal, they stayed with us pretty much as long as they had to. And in many cases, as soon as they could jump ship, they could jump ship. That's a Navy term. Um, I, I will tell you, as, as, an, as, a, as an anecdote, uh, our, our president and CEO at IDA is a fellow named David Chu. I think many in this, this, uh, this audience are familiar with David. Um, when I was showing him these results, he had been the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, and he said, you know, we see the same exact thing from the service academies. Service academy graduates are less likely to stay in the service than ROTC graduates. And he said, and it kind of makes sense, because, you know, if you kind of have to bribe someone to do a job, they're less likely to want to do it than if they kind of come willingly. So, so the same effects seem to be in place here. But we weren't quite satisfied with that. So we wanted to dive a little bit deeper. What was actually going on? And these are actual numbers. The three-year retention rate for overall SNE workforce is 86%. That's pretty good. Uh, for uh, the smart scholars, it was only about 73%. So, you know, not disastrous, but not accomplishing what we wanted. And then, you know, three quarters of the smart scholars actually leave the defense sector, uh, actually left the defense sector after they left DOD. So not only weren't we keeping them in, in our own labs, but when they left our labs, they didn't want to keep doing DOD stuff. So that was even worse. They weren't going off to industry. They weren't going off into academia helping us anyway. So one of the things we, we did, we, we asked them, why are you leaving? All right, what is it that's driving you away? Um, we we kind of got some nondescript answers. Uh, almost 80% said, well, they wanted to pr pursue other opportunities for career growth. That's kind of a euphemism for they weren't seeing a growth path within the DOD facility. Um, I like the 73% said that they were offered a job that was more interesting. That's troubling because I think we've got some really, really cool jobs in the DOD. So we're, again, we're not doing a good job of matching, matching folks to, to what they want to do. Uh, higher salary, that's not going to be a surprise to anyone in the room. But I'll argue that if you give them an interesting job, it's going gonna, it's gonna to overcome the, the, the salary issues. Um, and you know, the kind of the list goes on. But when we really dove in, we made another interesting discovery. And let me jump to this. So turns out smart, smart scholars were getting paid less than other SNEs. All right, on average, their starting salary was less, and, it wa and they weren't doing any better as the years went by. And we thought, this was interesting. So we interviewed people who were hiring smart scholars. And we said, why are you paying them less? And you know the answer we got was? Because we can. Because <laughs> they have to come work for us. They sign on the dotted line. They're forced to come here. I don't need to recruit this person. They're, they're, they're coming anyway. So surprise, surprise, you start someone at a, off at a lower, lower salary, and they continue to see they've got a lower salary, and they don't stick around. And then to make things even worse, we said, OK, so how do these smart scholars compare to the rest of the population? And uh, all their, their managers said, oh, they're great. They're the equal to or better of any other population that we've got. So you've got this group of talented, really good people that we have pre-selected, that we have invested all this money in, and then they come into our facilities, and on average, we don't treat them as well, and so they leave. So what's, what's wrong with that? Um, we also had the speculation that when we, we, our thesis was, our hypothesis was, that if you send someone to a smart facility that's far from home or far from where they want to live, uh, they're not going to be as happy. And, and this was the interesting one, because when we mapped this out, we found this to be true, that the smart scholars who were most likely to leave were the ones who were in places that were further from where they lived or wanted to live. And yet, when we asked smart scholars this question, when we actually said, actually, um, we actually posed uh, the question to them, hey, what is the factor that led to your leaving? They didn't list geographic location. So, uh, one can perhaps speculate that they themselves weren't being honest or, or, or there was an implicit concern with the location without being explicitly articulated. But part of the advice that we wound up giving back to uh, the smart office was, hey, pay attention to where you're sending these folks. Make sure they're happy with the part of the country. 
If someone doesn't want to live in Dayton, Ohio, for crying out loud, don't send them to Dayton, Ohio. Um, on the other hand, if they do want to live in Dayton, Ohio, then that's a great place to, to, to place them in a, in a DOD facility. Uh, some of the other things that we found as a result of this deep dive, uh, we showed that first, the advisor was important. And again, that's almost a no-brainer. But you had to find a very special kind of advisor, an advisor who had some prior connection to uh, a, a government facility or the DOD. Um, the best advisors were the ones who were funded by places like ONR. Yeah, you're going to send a student to a Navy facility, it really helps that their advisor understands what the Navy is all about. Um, an advisor had an emotional commitment, a willingness to contribute to national security, right? If you got an advisor who says, uh, gee, I don't want to work on national security issues, and by the way, I, I have faculty colleagues who, who would make that claim on a regular basis, those are not the advisors that you want advising smart scholars. And again, that seems almost obvious, but that wasn't being built into the program. And then proximity counted. Um, you know, one of the things we suggested is if you've got faculty members, you know, you, you want to have faculty members who are coming to the labs who are, um, who are engaged with the facilities where their students are being placed. All right, um, I'm almost at the end. I want to wrap up by, by just kind of uh, zooming back out to the 30,000-foot level. All right, I've talked about a couple of assessment activities that we've done, everything from predicting where the future will go to telling an agency how to do their own evaluations, what models they can follow, to doing a deep dive on data to figure out how well a program has worked. Um, just kind of back on the, on the soapbox, a bit of a organizational advertisement. Um, although I've only shown you four projects, we do this for a pretty long list of government agencies. Um, Homeland Security, Department, I already mentioned Department of Energy, but we do it for National Security Council. Um, uh, Department of Transportation, Director of National Intelligence, uh, FAA, Department of Commerce. Um, and, and very often the questions they're asking us are very similar to the questions that I've covered here. You know, how, do we, how do we assess what we're doing? How do we formulate our portfolio? Formulate our portfolio? Um, how do we know if we're accomplishing the goals that, uh, that we've, we've uh, set out, that we've articulated? Let me close on this note. Why do I think this is all important? Um, Last week, I was in a meeting with uh, the, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Paul Selva, a retired Air Force general. So, um, and, and he was kind of giving this overall view of, of world R&D spending. And there are various ways to measure the total, the total uh, spending on research and development around the world. Uh, generally, we agree that it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about $2 trillion across the entire world. Uh, the lower number, 1.9 trillion, is a, is a number that comes out of the National Science Foundation. The higher number, 2.4, comes out of UNESCO. But given the differing definitions of research and development, it's not surprising that there's some wiggle room. Um, right now, the United States accounts for about a little over 20% of the world research and development investments. We're still number one in terms of US dollars. Uh, China is number two. I will caveat that by saying the question I always ask is, how much does a dollar buy in China compared to a dollar in the United States? I think we all know that a dollar in China goes much further. So we could argue even today that Chinese investment is worth more than the US investment. Every plot that you see has a Chinese investment growing. So very soon, even in terms of raw dollars, we expect China will be larger. And also, it's not clear how much of this is, is, is properly disclosed. So take that with a grain of salt. But be that as it may, the US is still accounting for about 20% of the, of the world R&D investment. And you see the other key players, all right? Europe comes in at number three, all total together. Uh, Japan, Germany breaking out from Europe is uh, number five. South Korea rap rapidly rising, and a lot of central planning on their investments. Um, but now, among the, uh, within that data, it's very clear that within the US, R&D investment uh, in the non-federal sector has tripled relative to defense spending uh, since the 1950s. So there was a time when 50% of all R&D investments in the United States came from the Department of Defense. And at that same time, the US accounted for 50% of worldwide investments. So that meant that 25% of R&D investments around the world came from the Department of Defense. Right? Let that number sink in. Today, that number is probably about 4%. Arguably, still a large number, but not nearly the driving influence that it once had. So what does that mean? I, I would argue that it means um, the way the, the Department of Defense spends its dollars 
is even more critical today than it was in the 1950s. Right? The influence that we have as it falls, as it falls within our country, as it falls around the world, means that we have to be er even more careful today on, on how we spend our taxpayer S&T dollars. And one of the best ways that I know to do that, to ensure that we're doing that, is to first properly formulate our programs, and then establish the metrics to judge those programs, and then to do the evaluations to see if those programs are accomplishing what it is that we set out to accomplish. And then, extending that, linking those programs to those non-federal portfolios, to the non-DOD portfolios, but the non-federal portfolios, to in fact make sure that we're getting the most bang for, for our S&T dollars. And I, I suspect that's a, that's a message that, that, that will resonates well in, in this room, because I, I think that's, that's the endeavor that each one of you is engaged on um, as we go forward. So with that, let me, let me thank you for your attention. And